please uh, stop us then and there and uh, you're welcome to yeah ask what you need to and, and we will try and answer it as best we can. Thanks Shanae. So just in terms of some background and context, um, and, and I'm sure that most of the, the forum here will, will um, understand this and, and be close to this sort of detail. Um, but in terms of uh, digital identity playing an integral role in South Africa, realizing some of its um, goals in terms of the NDP, if we look at the strategic objectives for digital identity, focusing on inclusion, accessible and affordable, fit for purpose, financially sustainable, reduction in identity fraud, and, and simpler FICA processes as, as one use case, um, we can see alignment to the Department of Home Affairs, you know, where South Africa, you know, in terms of the identity status and citizenship, uh, are key enablers of empowerment, inclusivity, economic development, and national security. So that links very closely to what the Department of Home Affairs are, are trying to achieve in their space. Um, and we certainly feel that digital identity um, links very nicely strategically to that. In terms of the National Development Plan, developing a South Africa where everyone has access to health services with uh, an improved quality of education and a better, um, you know, well services, and that's linked to the NDP. In terms of the fourth industrial revolution, improving ICT infrastructure and rapid innovation, we certainly see that digital identity can start enabling a lot of this and and starting to to help us realise some of those those key goals. Then, in terms of the SOB's uh, vision for 2025. You know, financial sustainability, security, paramount. I mean, I'm sure that many people have seen what's been happening in terms of data leaks and that sort of thing within the press and with certain um, people out there. Um, we've got to look after this information, make people own their information and allow them to do so in a manner which opens them up to other opportunities um, and, and products. Thanks, Sine. Then in terms of the opportunities, um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of these, are especially around touchless transactions and making things simpler within uh, South Africa. If you look at e-commerce, it grew by 35% in 2020, and there's that increased need for the online authentication, and this is where digital identity can play a role again. Government grants, 61% of our population are receiving some form of social grant. We, we saw it with the, the special grants that came out now because of the pandemic. Um, you know, if we had a digital identity in place, which was effective and robust, we would have been able to solve for that a lot easier and make sure that we get the money to the right people that are actually needing it. Digital payments. Since 2020, we've seen the consumer shift and their spending habits in terms of contactless pay payments. 86% of consumers now have access to more payment methods, and these are on the increase. Healthcare, 84% of the population is dependent on public healthcare services. Digitizing this will improve that health provision to all. Administration, we all know the long queues we have to stand in when having to either um, go to get a, a new ID or passport, et cetera, these things could be sped up if we had a, a decent digital identity solution in play. Education, uh, in terms of the inequality that exists, it's still out there. There's only 22% of households having computers and 10% of those that have internet connectivity. These are things that digital identity can start really helping us uh, get around and start uh, solving for some of these barriers. Thanks, Janae. How it started, uh, I'm not going to spend too long on this. I think everyone would have seen this or most people would have seen this, but in 2016, the Financial Blockchain Consortium was established. 
there were members, especially within the financial services institution, amongst others, that started working together um, and they actually developed a, a solution in which they were proving digital identity and, and uh, being able to um, prove its interoperability between those participating um, entities. Um, the way that Banks of Africa got involved was we were actually approached by the Self Sovereign Identity Consortium and they asked us to lead the, the discussions in terms of digital identity. And the reason they did that was simply because they wanted to get a far broader reach. Um, they explained that because they were working with, um, they, they had done good work in working together as a group, but they wanted the power of digital identity to be realized. And the way to do that was to get out and start speaking to a wider, broader community, perhaps not just focused on financial services, but the other sectors that, that could benefit from um, digital identity. And one of the things we realized early on when we started having workshops in March of 2021 um, was that the community wasn't just the financial services and we started to get a lot more interest from uh, other sectors and other um, industries that could benefit from this. And this is where the digital identity community was born. And we've built that um, through the, the, the method of allowing anyone to join and participate in the discussions and to join the community in building this digital identity story, first of all, for, for South Africa, which was delivered in September 2021, which I think a lot of you might have uh, gone through already, but we would be happy to make that available um, to Meryl once again, so she can actually um, share that with the with the forum. Thanks, Shanae. So how, how did we go about building this community and, and the, the process that of, of engaging with the community, understanding what they saw um, this digital identity story being for South Africa. It was through a collaborative approach. What we did was we had participant interviews, we ran survey questionnaires, and we would prepare material for the focus group discussions so that we could run these uh, discussions with the community in an appropriate manner in order to obtain the information out of the community and understand what they were needing. Once we had run those focus group discussions, we then socialize those outputs. And you can see we have a non-exhaustive list of some of the community members that have taken part in these discussions to date. Um, and this continues to grow um, on a weekly, if not daily basis. We at the moment, we've got 60 plus um, organizations that are ta taking part in the IMSA community. And maybe a good time for me to talk about the branding now is it is called IAMSA because we felt we, we, we didn't want it to be um, something where we spoke to the Banks of Africa digital identity solution because it's not. It is something that the community are, are working on and that we're trying to build as South Africans. And that is why we called it IAMSA or otherwise IMZA. And please note, this isn't a product branding. This is purely a program branding so that we can identify with something that everyone get, can form part of and, and that it's done in the spirit that's, that we kicked it off in. In terms of some of the, the guiding questions and community outcomes, you know, the, one of the questions was what should the proposed digital identity ecosystem model be for South Africa? And in those discussions with the community, they, they expressed that it should be a hybrid ecosystem that combines the strength of both a centralized and the self-sovereign identity uh, world. So when the technical guys are looking at this is that they need to keep that, that in mind. Um, 
the reason for that, why the community said that that this was needed is because not everyone has access to smart devices. So how do we cater for those that don't have the smart devices or otherwise connectivity? We need to run some sort of hybrid model between a centralized and a self-sovereign identity world. Uh, what should be the key use cases? Um, so we mentioned EKYC in, in, this, in, in this community outcome, but during the process of unpacking the use cases with the digital identity community, they came up with 80 plus use cases, and then those were whittled down to three use cases which we want to focus on during the proof of concept. The first being EKYC or your FICA process, the second being a RECA process, which is linked to your mobile ne networks or your telco uh, environments. And then the third one is a vaccine status, which is linked to your healthcare. And it's not to recreate what has been done in terms of any of those spaces, but it's to help enable um, users to build their digital identity personas and then cater for those use cases. So those are the three use cases we want to focus on. I do want to mention, however, that there is an enrollment use case. So before in, you start building your persona is you will go through an enrollment um, process in which it'll check against the, the Department of Home Affairs and confirm things like, are you a South African citizen? Check a biometric. Uh, are you, what gender you are? Uh, your marital status and any other Im information that harness might hold that forms part of that initial onboarding or enrollment. Who will be the key stakeholders in South Africa? DHA remain the golden source of identity. They are the custodians for South African citizenship. That does not change. What digital identity does, though, is it leverages off of that to confirm that a person is who they say they are and to allow them to do that enrollment. What would be the proposed governance framework of this digital identity story for South Africa? The community felt that there needed to be an appointment of a scheme operator or administrator that provides the leadership and support by a board to provide oversight. And, and quite simply, that is someone that will build and manage their trust framework, their trust and governance framework within this digital identity space to make sure that people are able to, um, first of all, take part, but when they do so, that they meet the minimum standards that are set out by the scheme operator or administrator that will be watching the game and making sure that people are acting or organizations are acting appropriately within this digital identity space. If they're not, they will be exited. Um, and they need to adhere to the rules that are set out by the digital identity community and its board. What should be the overall technology framework? The community felt that distributed ledger technology needed to be used because it's scalable, it's fast, secure. And they said that the chosen technology should not be, well, should be tamper proof and should avoid cyber attacks or any other threats. Um, I see a hand up. Uh, Logan, please go ahead. Yes, no, no. I just wanted to comment on the one thing. Uh, yes, you know, I mean, I'm in agreement. It should be a distributed uh, a ledger technology, which is scalable, fast and secure. I'm in agreement with that. But I think the other thing is it has to be cost effective. If you look at some of the networks like the Ethereum networks, if you're going to build on those networks, it's going to be a bit ridiculous because the cost of the transaction is going to, I mean, the whole purpose of blockchain was to reduce cost as well. If you look at, I mean, you know, it's ludicrous uh, how payments work in the world, how long it takes to settle a payment. I mean, when your payment goes through a visa, it, it it's not even settled. You know, the message you get thinking it's settled, it's not really settled. It takes like two, three days to get settled. So I think cost effective is going to be a very, very important thing to add. Because I, I think once you build on a blockchain or distributed ledger technology, 
and you chose the wrong one, then you are messed up. I mean, it, to change it, it's going to be a very, very difficult. So I don't know, just a comment from my side. Logan. And, and, and I also think it should be ISO 222 compliant because ISO 222 is, is looking at the new standard. It comes into effect in November this year. And if you're going to build on a blockchain that is not compliant, it may disappear or it may be sued by any one government around the world, you know. So I think it's very important around which one you are choosing. Uh, sorry to interrupt the presentation. Not I just all. thought it's, it's good to come in at that point. No, Logan, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for your comments and and definitely very valid. Um, so so one of the the, the guiding principles while we were do, running through these focus group discussions was that we had to remain cost effective. If we don't keep it cost effective, we're not going to have the adoption we're looking for. And that were, I mean, if we don't have the adoption, what use is it having a digital identity system? So 100%, um, there is a, um, a technical focus group that focuses on the technology and, and what needs to be used. And we can certainly run and we can invite or, or run a session where the, we, we get into in-depth technology discussions and we can have the right people around the table um, to hold those discussions. But certainly uh, the community felt that it was essential that it remains cost effective not just for the end user for, from an adoption perspective, but for all the, the participating organizations that are um, forming part of the ecosystem. So a very valid point. Thank you, Logan. So Nate, can we move on? So as I mentioned, when, once we had gone through this process, we we came out with the, the digital identity or the South African journey, and, and this encompassed what the, um, the community had gone through during this process and established what this digital identity story was and what we felt or what the community felt was needed from a digital identity perspective. And we're happy to share that with the, with the forum uh, we'll share that with Meryl and she can distribute it to everyone. Um, there is a, a, a full report, but we also have a, a shortened version of it. So we'll share both of those with you. Thanks, Janae. So just see, I'll, I'll touch again just on some of the business objectives for, for the project. Um, those strategic objectives, obtaining the stakeholder support and buying for the solution is key. If we don't have that in terms of the ecosystem and people participating, we wouldn't have the traction that, that we, we've had to date. Establishing validity and sustainability, education of the citizens. We, we realize, the community realized that we're going to have to, it's going to be form part of making sure that this gets off the ground and, and that people understand what digital identity is, how it works, and how it's going to help them and enable them. Establishing the governing body and the business architecture, which I've spoken a little bit about, and then establishing the technical architecture, um, to Logan's point, making sure that we're using the right technologies and that we remain cost effective. Some of those measurements of this uh, success, uh, developing an engagement model and stakeholder mapping, which we've been through. We've delivered the business case, um, which we finalized it on the 22nd of March, and uh, sorry, 22nd of February and presented it to our board in March. We have, and I'll get into some of that feedback just around the business case a little bit later in the presentation. Um, the mitigation plan to deal with some roadblocks, so, so making sure that we have a solid and robust uh, marketing campaign, agreeing the trust model, the rules and uh, legalese, the scheme participation. That's something that we're starting to step through and, and Janelle mentioned it in, in the, uh, um, the next three months, what we're going to be focusing on, but that is key. We get, we, in terms of governance, that's where we're looking for more participation from people within the compliance space, governance space, and legal space. 
Um, and then interoperability and understanding that hybrid model and making sure that we have viable use cases so that we have, again, this adoption and participation. Some of those measurements, active participation from the community, signing up for the scheme. Um, this, this solution will only fly if we have participants from a, a, a community perspective, but also the users that are, are trusting this digital identity solution. The business management plan, funding models, business case and the commercial case was something underneath the, the, the validity and sustainability that we looked at. The consumer adoption, which I've spoken to, that scheme participation and membership, and then that technical viability, which is um, so key as well. So in terms of the way we looked at it, and so now we can move on, but we, we then split the community and we had three work streams, which this next slide talks to. And this is where, again, the, the offer is out there to anyone that wants to join the community and these discussions within these various work streams, depending on where you have expertise and knowledge. The business stream focusing on the business case and the, the, the commercial model within the governance stream, defining their trust model making sure that we have all the governance um, in place and ensuring that all the legalese are taken care of. Within the technology work stream, the focus initially and, and where we're getting very close to now is having the sandbox environment up and running so that we can start testing these use cases within an environment where the, the, the community members are taking part and testing these use cases between themselves. People. It reaches, I see it's nine o'clock. All right, uh, Janae, we can move on. Thanks, Janae. So, just in terms of the business case, um, some of the key decisions that were made during the program that underpinned our business case, and I wanted to touch on before taking you through some of the feedback, was just in terms of that digital identity model. Again, you know, a hybrid model was identified. Uh, I don't want to go into too much of that. The use cases, which I mentioned a little bit earlier on, the three pilot use cases that have been identified as EKYC the vaccination status and then RECA. The way we looked at it was also pretty, um, how can I say, uh, conservative, if you like, that we looked at it in horizons and, and we took a conservative approach in order to make um, it visible that even with only adopting a few use cases, there was still benefit commercially and that the solution would wash its face um down the line and the way we looked at that was that we had three pilot use cases and those were for the first five years and i'm sure as a community that we would definitely have more than three use cases within those five years but we did it from a business case and a commercial model perspective so that we could take that conservative view in terms of technology um bank serves role from a technical perspective is uh, been to establish the technology set um, and that will be used in the sand, sandbox, which has been agreed by the community. And again, this, this is not a bank serve saying this is the way we need to do it. Um, we certainly don't see ourselves as being the experts. We have some um, very uh, capable technical people within our technical space, but this is where their technology stream has been working very hard in establishing what is going to be used in the sandbox and from there would start understanding what would be the end state. And then of course the program brand which I spoke about IAMZA or IAMZA um, and again this is for something that the technology can, uh, sorry that the community can get used to and um, actually commit to. Thanks, Shanae. 
So in terms of the high level view of the proposed uh, hybrid uh, digital identity model, this is very high level and, and we're working on getting a little bit more detail. But in the middle, we have had this interoperable platform. The community had this in, interoperable platform, which had the DI credential, um, which had the, the registry or repository for the, the, um, the centralized model to cater for the centralized model. At the bottom, you have the, the wallet, which organizations can um, or, or that the end user would be um, generating. And then you would have your issuers on the left hand side, and those would be made up of government entities such as the DHA, SASA, um, SARS, credit bureaus, as well as any other credential issuers such as banks, telcos, fintechs. So. On the left hand side, we have the issuers, but on the right hand side, the verifiers. They could play both roles, uh, being an issuer or a verifier, depending on where that information set. At the top then, we spoke to having this administration and oversight governing body. So that's at the top. And then we have that advisory board who looks after um, the the governing body and those rules that the governing body will instill within the trust framework which takes care of the entire ecosystem thank you Janae. so what is digital identity i, I don't want to go into this i think most people in the forum would uh, understand it but you know, it's it's attributes that uniquely describe the person engaged in an online transaction. It's electronically captured stored attributes and credentials that can uniquely identify the, comp the, the, the person as well as individualize the person in a computer based environment. Um, why is it important? I've touched on some of these things, simplifying, um, you know, onboarding experience and reducing identity fraud, improving access financial inclusion, greater pr privacy protection. Um, Poppia, I think we're all being touched by it. We understand the importance of it. F um, more secure online transactions, which I've touched on, and promoting digitization, which hopefully will drive the efficiency and productivity. Why Bank Serve Africa? We've been around for 50, uh, 50 years now. We have a track record within the banking and corporate sector. Um, Bank service regarded as trusted, stable and sustainable. We offer these interoperable solutions and that is why we were approached to, to try and bring the various parties that are out there within this digital identity ecosystem together to start discussing what it is that they, we need as South Africa in this digital identity space. And I don't need to tell you why the timing's right for digital identity. I mentioned some of the things already, but I, I'm sure you understand it. Thanks, Shanae. Shanae, thank you. What are some of the broad benefits of digital identity? So financial inclusion, increased productivity, time saving benefits, reduction in fraud, um, improved market and business competitiveness, economic growth, greater access to employment, improved access to services, reduced administration and transaction cross, uh, costs. Um, what could digital identity mean for, for South Africa? increased inclusion spoken to, improved KYC and FICA processes as a starting point, reduced fraud and identity theft we've touched on, the convenience and of course a better user experience. What would make it successful? Making sure that we're using the appropriate model, something the community uh, continues to, to, to drive, ensuring the platform is interoperable, efficient uh, central administration process, government and community involvement, utilizing the appropriate technology. Could digital identity be commercially viable? Um, yes, it can be, but linked to the point that Logan made, this is not where we, it, it can't be a profit maximizing solution. We need to make it affordable, 
easy to access and make sure that people adopt it. So in terms of what we looked at as a business case is the solution would only be making or washing its face after uh, six years, six to seven years. So this is not a space where we want to make money. It's around a space where the community wants to provide a solution to the end users and ultimately start bringing the things and the targets and, and um, solutions that we're trying to cater for, making them accessible. What are some of the key risks that, you know, that could cause this digital identity implementation to fail? Lack of government involvement. It's something that we're chasing and that we want more participation from government in. We see the benefits of the solution uh, and, and being realized if we have this participation from the private and public sector. Poor adoption I've spoken to, loss of momentum, lack of skills, implementation complexities. Thanks, Sinead. Eh? Did it move, Max? Uh, uh, it hasn't. It has now. Okay. All right. So just to touch on some of the board outcomes and, and the way forward. So as I mentioned, uh, we took it to our board at the end of March. Um, the business case has not been approved as yet. Um, and it's because the board has asked us to provide them with more certainty and clarity on a number of items that, that were in the business case and, and commercial model. Um, in terms of what they've asked us re to revisit, they'd like us to look at funding options or partners. They'd like us to stress test some of the assumptions that we had within the business case, defining what success looks like. So starting to look at um, having a trust model and governance model in place. You know, one those were some of the success criteria that we felt needed to be there and that we're going to be working on for the board. Confirming government involvement and commitment in the program. They want us to show them where the government is participating and to confirm that we have the involvement. They see the need for that government involvement and participation to make this digital identity uh, solution a success. Confirming resource commitment. This resource commitment yeah, is the confirmation of the uh, the participants within the community. So they've asked us to confirm some of the commitment there. And then the community commitment linked to that. Um, my apologies, the, the, the resource commitment is around um, that we're not using the same resources within the rapid payments program with re, which we're running within BankServe with the digital identity um, resources to ensure that we're able to deliver on both um, projects simultaneously. Thank you, Janae. All right, before we go on to the plan for the next three months and Janae takes us through this, I'd, I'd like to pause and just see, I, I could see that there were a couple of questions coming up in the chat. Um, I'd like to ask if, if there's perhaps anyone else that would like to ask any questions at this time. Uh, Johan, good morning. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, well, thank you yourself. Good, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, in, in the chat, you'll see me a couple of times harp on about the, the private nature of uh, a DLT. And for me, at, as soon as you go private, you lose so much of the benefit of a DLT. And, and I'd rather have a trusted central party like bank servers with some good APIs, actually. That would give me more speed more transparency, more whatever. Um, so, and and for me, the one of the big sticky points is it, it's all good and well if it's a private community, my digital identity in that community might be really strong. But as soon as I jump on a plane to Australia and I'm stuck in a hurricane there, that digital identity that could be very, very useful if it was in a public uh, DLT space becomes really useless because I'm not in my little community of trust. So I, 
if I could just make one plea is please. If you guys go to the private space, please make sure that you take every avenue to see that you can't go to the, the public space first. Jan, great, great comment, and certainly we'll take it back to the team and, and happy to have a conversation with perhaps some of the, the more technical guys to, to unpack that. Um, I think that definitely what, what came out of the community sessions was that when we build a solution, we have to ensure that we meet uh, security criteria and that, that we're able to start when when the time is right to actually start linking to other digital identities elsewhere in the world um so certainly that is one of the key things that that the um that the team is focused on and need to maintain during the during this build thank you Han. and and please uh if you'd like a, a more in-depth discussion Meryl, we we happy to to facilitate um, a discussion whereby we unpack more of the technical details. I've I've seen quite a number of comments just around DLT and and that sort of thing. And I definitely think that um, our technical guys that speak that language would be more suited to have that discussion and explain where they are at the moment in terms of the sandbox and also some of the plans going forward. So we'd be happy to set that up. Thanks, Meryl. Uh, Tolewa, good morning. Good morning, Max. Thank you for the for the compelling presentation. Uh, my question um, on this initiative is really on the demand side, and I'm noting the the comments that you you've received from the Bank South Africa's board, but I'm also noting that the three use cases that are based on your community engagements came came out top. So maybe my question is then twofold. Firstly, of those three um, use cases or scenarios, which one do you believe, or which one have we have we put at the forefront of our roadmap? And are the are the partners for that? You know, how how far are we on the partners of uh, on the journey of adoption with the partners, or in in the journey of partner readiness for that? And then the second question is, uh, is based on something you mentioned around also one of, of the board requirements regarding providing certainty um, and government's buy-in um, and endorsement of this solution. So my question on that one is, you know, what are your go to green uh, strategies or considerations to, to, to kind of close that gap and, and to provide that assurance? Thanks, Tolewa. Uh, I will try and ans answer it as best I can. So in terms of the initial focus, and we'll cover that in, in the plan for the next three months, the focus for now is EKYC. So we will focus on that as our starting point. I think the, the, the reason for that decision is so that we maintain momentum while we busy during this three months period in terms of answering some of the board um, questions but also so that we can prove this um, within the POC. In terms of the attributes which sit within that EKYC space, it caters for a lot of the, um, or, or some of the, the RECA attributes, as well as perhaps uh, some of the, the, the status, the vaccine status attributes as well. So although we, we, we want to solve for one use case, there are certain um, attributes that sit within the EKYC space that could be reused. So uh, that's the reason for the decision there. In terms of the commitment in terms of volume and participation, we haven't reached that point yet, and it will be something that we are going to be discussing with some of the community members in terms of commitment and uh, going forward so that we can um, you know, try to tick that box, if you like, for the board members. In terms of government participation, so we have got government participating, and um, there's been the likes of the presidency that have been um, participating within the community. Um, we've had the Saab involved, um, a, as well as Treasury. Um, we, we've had the DHA or participation from the DHA at certain points, but it hasn't been as active a, as we would like it to be. And we would like to move a lot closer to the likes of the Department of Home Affairs 
as well as the department how it comes to the vaccine status, um, which is something that we're working on during these this three month period. Um, we've also started speaking um, and we have participation from some telcos, um, but we are discussing our, and in conversation with other telco members to start becoming more active in the digital identity program and sharing with them what we've done to date. So I hope that answers your question, Tolewa. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Good morning, Tim. Uh, th thanks, Max, um, and morning to everybody. Um, um, I, firstly, I think the you know just as a broad initiative, um, uh, maybe just focusing on um, your focal point, which is FICA, which um, you know I think is a is a is a great starting point. I think if you can solve FICA, I think you can solve you can solve any, everything. N number one, because of our you know, our history as a country, um, the ability to uh, well the difficulties we all face in uh, the unbanked market. So where, where, uh, for example, young people, I work with uh, young um, excluded youth, uh, where, where, where we cannot tie a, an, an identity to an address or a, or, a, or a person. So biometric and these, these other versions, which, which, which are absolutely bulletproof, as we know, in the verification space, uh, one in uh, 13 trillion, I think, when you, when you use two fingerprints, for example, and that verification just opens up a huge amount of opportunity for everyone. So I just think no matter what, you know, and, and again, it's always a fine balancing act between, um, you know, governments and private sector. I just think if you can get the, whether it's distributed, you know, whether it's a verification through an API to the custodian of, you know, however the, the, the technical model looks like, I think just keeping that focus on, on solving for FICA. Um, and, you know, even across banks, for example, that share the banked markets um, identity is a really, really great starting point. I, I guess my question was was simply, um, you talk about the seven years, and I, and I guess it's coming up in your plan for the next three months, but you talk about the seven years investment. Um, that's a, if, we, if we think about this as a private sector led, uh, private sector led, op you know, it's like an opportunity to, to be a private sector led uh, thing. That government can then sort of uh, plug into as the verification later. Um, how do you how do you, you you create that balancing act of buy-in for that sort of verification, which I think is going to be a sticky point. Well, could be a sticky point later with um, you know various legislation, etc. Um, and have you planned that uh, the adoption? You know, do you expect the adoption uh, numbers to 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 go along with the sort of seven-year time frame of um, uh, what, uh, what's the word? Not scalability, but um, co you know the, the cost cost curve that you spoke about. Um, so have you plan? I mean, have you planned in in that without having to have government 100% on board? But have you planned in the sort of adoption side with the, from from a verification perspective? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, if, are you are you done? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Tim, look, uh, in terms of the, the approach when we looked at the, the financial model, it was certainly conservative. So in terms of the adoption, we, we weren't even catering for all of the banked users, if, if you like, so not even looking at the, the unbanked. Um, so we took a very conservative approach when, when looking at that, that adoption, and it was because of these unknowns. And, and these unknowns uh, are things that we're going to start unpacking now in terms of, um, first of all, that the biometrics and, and the use of, of them, um, but also from a, a trust framework and governance perspective, um, having a look at where we might have some issues in terms of legalese and um, perhaps some uh, legal that or, or legislation that we might have to look at working around or otherwise having a look at changing or, or looking to, to discuss changing it. So it's stuff that we're still busy unpacking and going through as a community and, and as a, a program team. This is where, as I was mentioning, and we'll get to it a little bit later, where we really want to start focusing now on that uh, governance stream in terms of removing some of these barriers, understanding, first of all, what are those barriers and how do we remove them or, or work with them in terms of making this digital identity work uh, for South Africans? 
I, I hope that answers your question, Tim. Good morning, Bonga Kile. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Good morning. Yes, you have uh, pronounced it uh, correctly. Uh, my name is Bonga Kile. I'm from the Department of Communications, working in the Office of the Minister, and I'm responsible for ICT innovations and SMME support. So when the minister uh, joined the department, uh, she started an initiative which is uh, for to consolidate all local develop solution in one digital platform, which is called Digitech. And the, the, the purpose of this Digitech uh, portal is to collect data about digital products developed locally with the aim of supporting products and uh, technology enablement, promoting them and also expanding their market reach. So in the main uh, focus, the department through Digitech intends to promote SA developed digital products in other markets while facilitating partnership with other countries on co-op promotion of local technologies. So mainly of these digital products that we have in our portal, are mobile digital payment solutions and also e-commerce platform. So the main challenge now that we have been facing is around um, security in terms of transition and also mm -hmm. to identify the users. So I think with this uh, initiative and also with this uh, digital uh, ecosystem is going to assist us as the department, but I wanted to find out <laughs> how do we department, um, participate in this or join uh, this initiative, as I think even our minister will be very interested mm -hmm. as, uh, in aligning it with, with, with this initiative. Bonga Kili, it's music to my ears. Um, so we we will be sharing a um, an oh, email yeah, address at, at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation. Sorry, I just uh, I think someone's got the mute button. What can I download? Um, sorry, I can't see who that is. Um, but Bunga Kile, certainly, um, if you could possibly. Um, and I'm happy to share my, my contact details with you as well. Um, but we would certainly love a conversation with yourself or otherwise with the minister or his team or her team um, to, to unpack you know, what you guys are busy with and how you can participate. Um, as we said, we, we've pretty much maintained an open door policy um, in terms of participation. And we'd love for you guys to get closer to what we're doing and to participate and, and actually see how we could collaborate in making this um, you know, come together. And, and this is what it's about. I mean, I think Tim was talking about uh, adoption, et cetera. But if you have these products that could benefit from a digital identity and people gaining access to it, um, or, or to those services and, and products, that is exactly what we're looking for and, and what we want to prove. So we would be more than happy to have that, that conversation, uh, Bonga Kile. Thank you so much. Um, Bonga Kile, can I ask you, um, uh, do you mind just staying on uh, uh, once we're done and then we can just um, share contact information? Noted with things, I'll, I'll remain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my apologies. Is it AJ? Good morning, AJ. Yes, that is correct. Good, Good morning. morning. So, so I, I, I have a number of key observations. I, I, I think from a financial model perspective, and and the business opportunity, I think the there is some. I've, done quite a bit of work with a number of different organizations around financial modeling in terms of using blockchain and blockchain identity elements. That's one. Two, I, I find that when people start talking about uh, people and the digital twin, if I must call it that, um, that we make it a hugely financially expensive use case and only see, see benefits long term, um, which then leads me to the point, the fact that uh, the actual individual doesn't gain any benefit from it uh, as participating in that ecosystem. Um, and that affects a lot of a lot of our South Africans and puts them out of out of reach in terms of that. Um, 
Needless to say, yes, the Talco communities should should actually come to to, to the party. But I think also a, a distributed environment per se in terms of um, a whole blockchain in terms of DLT is a distributed ledger technology. But again, also based on the actual architecture of this environment, it should be more focused on a distributed type type environment, uh, and thereby becoming inclusive with a with a wider worldwide community adoption. And then finally, in terms of just one other observation is that uh, every person should have a wallet and that is kind of, needless to say, there should be an, an integration of those things, which then leads to a further discussion around things like the unbanked community, which leads to things around digital currency, which is very different to, to, to what is actually cryptocurrency and the old NFT type type models. So there's a whole lot of discussion points that for me is still unclear based on on just the overview of the discussion that you've just provided. So I think there needs to be further discussion around these types of things, uh, both from a technical perspective, um, also a governance perspective in terms of who owns this information. And for me, the ownership of the information is 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 the person themselves slash under the governance structure of the Department of Home Affairs, um, where they are effectively managing that that whole distribution of that identity. So that's a discussion point that can go on forever. And then also the financial model in terms of providing distributed architecture from an infrastructure and a blockchain technology perspective should also be engaged uh, from, a, from a business model perspective, which then speaks to the whole public versus private kind of um, areas and how information gets shared and distributed amongst various, I wanna say partners and members of this, this, this community. Um, but that becomes a whole business discussion around that. So yeah, that's my comment. Thank you very much, AJ. And and it's certainly gives us a lot of food for thought. And and it's it's some of the stuff that the the community has been discussing discussing. And and one of the reasons why we also want to have a, a more uh, or a closer relationship to the likes of the Department of Home Affairs. Um, so that we can start having some of um, those discussions I, in terms of the who owns the the identity. It's certainly the person um, and the community in terms of the process of sharing of the information. It gets back done on the back of the consumers or the, the digital identity holders consent and they have to know because they're having an interaction with whoever it might be, see, uh, might be at, uh, let's say ABC traders in an in an, an example, um, they know that they have an interaction or they discussing um, a product or service with with ABC traders, and they know the reason why that ABC traders needs the information. Um, and they will release it on the back of their consent. So it's not just a case of anyone has information uh, or has access to to Max's information. It's done so on the back of a, an interaction or um, a relationship between the, the the holder of the identity and and who they are interacting with. But thank you, AJ. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm going to hand over to Janae, who will take us through the, the plan for the next three months. Thank you, Janae. Great, thanks, Max. Good morning, everyone. So just on the plan for for the next three months leading up to the up to the second board meeting that is towards the end of June. So if we if we focus on the the various streams, our first stream is of course our business stream. And the business stream for the next couple of weeks is really focusing on the, the business process flows and the user journeys for, for the use cases. So during during March and the, the last few weeks in April, or the yeah, the last the last few weeks, we've been focusing on 
unpacking the the first draft of those business case of the business requirements for for the EKYC and enrollment use case along with the the process flows and that has now we are now updating that so we've we've done a high level version of that and now there is there is um sorry now we're going into a bit more detail to showcase what the the EKYC and the enrollment use case business process flows are there's a community session that's coming up towards middle of May, which I'll speak to about later. But the main focus is really about getting the our EKYC and our enrollment business process flow and, and user journeys unpacked and, and finalized. And the reason for, for focusing on EKYC and enrollment, enrollment, Max has touched on that, but our financial community is along is a lot further on this journey with us. So for the next five or six weeks, we're focusing on that, but not to say that our RECA and our vaccine status use cases are not, they're not being left behind. So they're sort of running parallel to that. Then from a, from a governance perspective, it's really about designing what the governance framework and our trust framework for IAMSA will look like. So we've done some global research on governance structures. We've done some global research on what various trust frameworks in Canada for sovereign and, and so forth looks like. And we've taken from that to see what is it that we can use for South Africa, but what in addition to that is, is it that we need to design specifically for, for IAMDA. And then towards the end of, of June, we're really trying to finalize revision A or a draft of both our governance and our trust framework. And then the last one is, of course, our board stream. So we've added a, a, another stream to our to to the streams that Max spoke about earlier. And that board stream is really to to add, to I want to say zoom in and focus on those areas that the board the board has raised. The first one is, of course, the the, the assumptions we are trying to or not trying to we are stress testing our assumptions we develop we're busy developing two scenarios so that we can see how we can what our hypothesis and what analysis can we do for to compare both our quantitative and our qualitative assumptions and then compare that against our base case which our business case is currently based on then the second one is of course to define the success so we're trying to define an answer the question what does success look like not only for the program but also beyond the program so for that end state of the of digital identity then of course government involvement we've heard it numerous times today and on previous occasions about how important government involvement is so we we have identified government stakeholders we've identified more government stakeholders this morning so i want to include those in our in our community communication plan and define what are the, the actions that we can improve, that we can take to improve our government involvement. And then lastly, that Max also mentioned earlier is of course our capacity issues. So to highlight, where are the um, capacity constraints? Where are the critical risks that have been identified? And how can we mitigate those risks? Okay. Before I move on, is there, are there any questions? Did I lose anyone? Shanae, I don't see any hands. I know okay. you can't see any. Okay, cool. So then basically, then from a community perspective, how do we need or where do we need your, your help? So we have a number of community sessions coming up. And what we've done is we've split our community sessions across our different streams. So we have our business stream, we have our technical stream, and of course our, our governance stream. And the first, the, the first ask of you is really about getting involved. So there's, an, there's a, a lot of, regular and interactive sessions. So between now and, and the end of, of somewhere next year. So really, if you want to get involved, 
us know so that we can assist a lot of assistance that we might need just to sort of to respond to those and to make sure that the that we you are included in in the decision making process and then a lot of these times we we need to unpack and know how many people will join so please if you can just request your your availability and then also to review some of the recommendations and output we've said from the start that this is a it's a community led program so it's really about the I want to say the commitment between Banks of Africa, PwC, but also our, our community members. So please, if there's suggestions or uh, recommendations that you have, we've heard quite a few this morning um, around the technology and the, the, the DLT. We can, as Max mentioned, have a session with, with our technical team and we can really try and, and work together. And then the other thing is, of course, funding. So in order for this thing to be successful at the end of the day, it of course needs funding. So the, if there is anyone that is willing to assist with some funding, they can please reach out to Max, who holds the wallet on, on this program. So then just about, I've mentioned the working group session. So what have we got planned in a, from April to July? So there's a number of, we have these weekly sessions that alternate between technical governance and, and business. So at the same time that this session is on this morning, our technical working group is also busy doing some design work. And then of course we have our broader community with the 60 plus organizations um, about once month so we had one session towards the end of last week and then the second the next session is coming up in the mid middle of may and then once we get feedback from the board again towards the end of june we will have another community session with a broader with a broader team to to update on that so please if there's anyone that wants to get involved who is not already involved please reach out to either myself or max or even you can reach out to meryl and and she will put us in contact with you Okay. Hey, Max, back to you on some next steps. Thank you, Janae. All right, just in, in terms of the next steps over the next three months, uh, just like to, and, and I think that we've touched on most of these, but just as a, a recap. So we will be addressing the focus areas that we've put, that have been put forward by the board. We will develop revision um, on revision A on the trust framework, which we are going to be kicking off next week. So for those of you that would like to join the community or and, and have skills either within legal, compliance, governance, within that space, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, Finalising business flows for the enrolment as well as the, the EKYC use case. Uh, continue to populate these high level use case design documents and establishing the relevant supporting documents for for the relevant streams. That's what the program team is going to be focusing on in, ter in terms of external participants. So prepare preparation for the focus group discussions that are coming up in April, May and June. As I mentioned, we try and send out information and have the community um, prepare for the discussions that we're going to be having with them so that they have some context and can um, actively participate in the discussions that we're having. And then these continued discussions with the, the, the telcos, with the um, health sector, as well as other government stakeholders. And please, um, once again, uh, the offers out there to ever thinks they can lend to the conversation and is interested in digital identity and have thoughts on digital identity to please join the community discussions and also let us know which streams you'd like to participate in. Thank you, Janae. Um, so we have our contact information. You can see that we have a centralized mailbox. So you're welcome to either contact us directly um, and I'm happy to put my email address into the chat um, or for Meryl to share it with all the, the forum participants and please reach out to us. Um, and once again, thank you for your time. 
uh, appreciate the, the keenness and, and the interactive manner of the, the discussion. And yeah, uh, Meryl, thank you very much to you and Anushka for setting this up and back to you. Thanks very much, Max. Um, yeah, I forgot to say thank you to Anushka. Um, Anushka has been bugging me about this for, for quite some time. So thank you, Anushka, for not stopping bugging me <laughs> because I've been so busy on other things. So yeah, so I'm really, uh, it's wonderful. We had, I think at one stage, we had about 120 participants in the middle of kind of serious uh, load shedding. So, I mean, that's, you know, people are interested. People want to see this work. You know, people are, are keen to participate. So, you know, um, and, and I'm very, I'm very kind of, yeah, focused on Team South Africa to solve these kinds of problems because we all benefit from from these initiatives. This isn't, isn't a responsibility only of government or only of the private sector, or only of academia. You know, this is something we really, really need to work on together uh, and and make our skills available to the team. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to find some 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 proper funding to to drive this. But in the meantime, you know, each one of us has have got certain skills and capabilities. And, you know, this is something that is is critical to the country uh, going forward because Digital identity is what the fourth industrial revolution uh, is based on. I mean, if you don't, if you can't identify, you know, a, a person, an organization or a thing, then, you know, how can you actually trust the, um, any transactions that you undertake with them? So, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know if there are any other comments or, or questions. Um, um, well, you know, any any last minute comments and questions are, are very welcome. Anushka, I don't know if you want to say something as well. Um, you're on mute, Anushka. <laughs> OK, so sorry, Anushka, you'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> You're Same having a few time. problems, yeah, this morning, yes, but yeah. So, so Anushka, uh, um, thanks, as I said, for bugging me. Thanks, thank you, Max. Thank you, Janae, and thanks for the whole community in in actually being willing to to sit down and and do something about this issue. Um, hopefully, we'll have another update session soon. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Those that have been asked to stay behind. Oh, Logan, you had a comment. Please, over to you. Yes, no, what, what I was going to say is, you know, one of the things that, that I think is quite positive with the, this whole distributed ledger technology is that it's an ideal platform for also getting entrepreneurship growing in South Africa. And if I had to look at countries that are leading in terms of blockchain, I think Germany is is by far way ahead of any other country, followed by maybe Singapore, and uh, the US is like third. Uh, so this is an ideal technology where South Africa, we could also put position South Africa in terms of the distributed ledger technology. Because the way I see, there's various applications for this thing. If you look at, you know, uh, when Bitcoin came into being, it's over now 10 years. And the financial sector has not moved with the technology, really. Yes, there are little uh, projects all over the world going, but we haven't migrated to this thing, and it's over now 12 years. So other sectors have actually taken these technologies and been more uh, leading in it. If you look at, for example, in China, you can go into China, and just by your digital identity, the, you walk into a shop, you choose what you want to take, and you just walk out of the shop. And it charges this to the to your digital identity and your wallets and all of it. So they've, they've really looked at integrating this. So I think South Africa, it's also early uh, stages in this technology. So I think if we can start getting in there and develop this, 
And for, for example, just teaching people how to develop on the blockchain. And it's not like new technologies. It's the same Java, Java Plus, and those software that you need uh, skills in. But perhaps uh, this project and other projects like this will position South Africa on the map. And I'm not sure where South Africa is, but I'm sure we're not in the top 10. But perhaps to look at positioning us in at least the top 10 in the world on blockchain development. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Thanks, Logan. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that, um, yes, South Africa might not, well, theoretically, South Africa isn't in the top 10 in the world. But if you look at a lot of the major blockchain initiatives that are happening around the world, I mean, it actually doesn't matter what country you're in. We have amazing developers. I mean, I think the bulk of initially the consensus developers, for example, were, were mainly South Africans. So let's not underestimate the skills that we have in this country and the opportunity for startups in the blockchain world. I mean, it is early days, and I thought it was early days four years ago, but it's still early days. Um, but there's, you know, there's there's huge opportunity in this space because, you know, as a world, we are we are struggling at the moment with trust um, and with what is the truth and what isn't the truth. We need a solution. And, and I sincerely believe that um, blockchain distributed ledger technologies is the solution to the trust issue we have in the world at the moment. So, yeah, from from a Sandba side, um, please go to the Sandba website and join Sandba so that you can be made aware of 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 uh, sessions like this. We're also looking at a lot of um, educational programs, etc. Um, if you're interested either in the technology or in the, the actual st strategic view of blockchain, um, it's something we're focusing on. Um, and as the CSR, um, we're focusing a lot now on you know, how we can support initiatives such as um, this one, the IMZA, uh, with Max and Co, um, because we have multiple technologies um, that have been developed for South Africans by South Africans that can add a lot of value to, to these kinds of initiatives. So, yeah, there's huge opportunities. Um, Max and Janae, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone else. Um, really, really appreciate it. Cheers, everyone. Um, Meryl, so yes. before you go, uh, I do see that there is a hand up. Oh, um, OK. Um, Craig's Craig. got his hand up. Craig, over to you. I said a little bit earlier on. You see, um, we might it might seem that South Africa is far behind in this year, but they are the, the problem that we have here is that we're not cohesive. We don't we don't work as an entity. To, uh, in blockchain, you'll find yeah. the corporate sector will be doing one thing, the financial sector will be doing one thing, and government on the other hand, where I'm in, we're doing one, we're doing some, we're doing uh, something else, and it's fragmented right now. Um, uh, in fact, uh, what what is not a known fact, I suppose, um, is that Nigeria, for instance, right now is the second biggest adopter of of cryptocurrencies in the world. That's Nigeria, Ni Nigeria, and this is a, this is an absolute fact. Um, I know this um, t because I'm currently researching um, cryptocurrency and in a master's uh, course that I'm doing at at, uh, at first right now. Also, um, with China banning cryptocurrency, there was a dip in what was uh, thought that um, there's going to be a movement against it. But you can see the way the world the world is moving because uh, President Biden um, basically said something very similar to what China is thinking because they want to create the digital yuan and uh, and America wants to create the digital dollar. So this part that we're on over here now, there's no turning back. I think the age of um, traditional fiat currencies are is coming to an end. It'll, it'll be a long, long while, but it'll be the same as what you see now with um, the traditional telephone lines and WhatsApp. It's exactly the same thing. I think we've embarked on, 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 on a strategy of here that is, that is, that is only going to go one way. Um, of that, I'm absolutely sure. And I think that um, this platform here gives everybody a chance to basically to have a, a, have a, to, to, it's a, one of the things that will reduce fragmentation, as I said in the very beginning of this, that um, when people talk about it and the more people talk about it and the more people talk about it in different spheres, you, you'll actually see the linkages becoming very, very easy um, afterwards. And I, for one, am, I'm, I'm very happy that Meryl's 
and Anushka has actually brought this together because um, right now uh, I know for a fact that that also Treasury is busy re-looking uh, the the protocols and and the legislation around digital currency. So and 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 the blockchain. So I, I foresee that the only way in the Soviet is up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. Um, OK, so yeah, uh, I guess let me put myself on again. <laughs> so um, that's it, folks. Um, yeah. You're welcome yeah. to contact me. Um, I, I did put the, the um, email address if you want to be part of of the IMZA um, initiative. Um, the, the, I did post it in the chat. Um, I will send through everyone who who attended. I will I will send through um, the documents that I've already got from from Max and Co. Um, for your information. Um, yeah, thank you. Meryl, we'll share the deck with you as well for distribution. Great. Thank you so okay. much. And I see Anushka has a hand up again, so maybe she has sorted out to the sound. Yes, I finally managed to get onto my phone. <laughs> you make a plan these days, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to Max and team. I mean, you've taken what started as a little investigation in the SAFBC and the team worked really hard to, you know, demonstrate the power of SSI and you brought it this far. Um, as we're sitting here and chatting and as I see the diversity of industry in the room, I'm actually thinking we have enough in the room to start a SSI marketplace um, or actually a valuable marketplace using this technology and we can start playing with it instead of just a POC that's doing KYC. So I hope I'm planting a seed in people's heads and by the end of the year I can buy airtime using my SSI wallet. Just putting it out there. Um, so thanks to everyone once again. And uh, Meryl, thanks for organizing. I have picked up a trend in people talking about three topics, uh, technical governance and financial considerations. Um, and I think that we may chat to Max and team to organize just three deep dive discussions into those three topics, because I think it will be valuable for those who don't fully want to participate, but want the knowledge and the know-how, it can be an open forum like this and uh, we'll see what we can set up in the short term. So thanks again, everyone, for attending. It's because you're here that makes us continue doing what we do and we'll keep flying the SSI flag. And thanks, Gary. Thanks for joining today. <laughs> Ta, that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Anish. Well done, Gary. Thank you. Uh, cheers, everyone. Thanks, cheers. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Unga Kile, I am staying on. I haven't forgotten. So we can just.